Hi, this is Sean from One With Nature, and in part two, we discovered the ideal condition of the cells of the body, and we also looked at a representation of what happens to the cells when they are waterlogged, and how do they get waterlogged? Well, we learned a little bit about the blood protein albumin, and how it was capable of pulling water to it, no matter where it is in the body. Now, until the late 1940s, it was believed by almost the entire medical community that plasma proteins, like albumin, could not possibly leave the bloodstream, and people staked their reputations on this. They said that albumin was too big, the spaces in the blood capillaries were too small, it can't be done. But what many people do not know is that it was first proposed back in 1930 that this could indeed happen, and it was proven in 1948. Yes, over 60 years ago, that albumin can indeed leave the bloodstream under normal conditions every day. In 1948, Dr. H. S. Mayerson, the father of lymphology of the Tulane University School of Medicine, tagged radioactive iodine to the blood proteins and discovered that in a 24-hour period, up to 50% of the blood protein can leave your bloodstream. It has taken decades for this information to reach a wider audience in the medical community. How many lives could have been changed for the better if people had known about the link between disease and plasma proteins decades ago? This is why I refer to the series as Lymphatic System Secrets. Now, the quote here is from the American Medical Association Home Encyclopedia from 1989, and it says, The large size of the protein molecules prevents them from escaping from the blood into the tissues. Well, that was 1989, almost 20 years ago. What do people have to say in the medical profession about this today? Well, here is a direct quote from a website developed to supply information to nurses to keep them up to date on medical developments. Quote, the difference in protein of tissue fluid and blood plasma is all because protein molecules that are too large to pass through the capillary membranes are retained in the blood. This helps to maintain the osmotic pressure of the blood. That's from 2005. Here's a quote from the Merck Online Medical Library. Normally, this filtering system permits fluid in small molecules, but almost no protein or blood cells to leak. That's from uh, 2008, I believe. So, in the last few years, knowledge of this has accelerated dramatically. But uh, let's get back to the albumin. With fluid building up where there should be barely any, the nutrients in the blood cannot reach the cells any longer because the cells are too far away in this waterlogged environment. Remember, the fluid going in and out of the blood capillaries happens very fast, so it doesn't have enough time to travel the distance between the wall of the capillary and the immediate area of the cell in order to feed them nutrients that it needs. The normal distance between the capillaries and the cells is two hundredths of a millimeter. It's a very short distance. Because the oxygen cannot reach into the cellular environment along with all the other nutrients, we move from an oxygen-rich environment to an oxygen-poor environment. And what do you think is happening to the simple sugar glucose trapped in there with no oxygen around? Well, it's starting to ferment. As the oxygen level continues to lower, friendly microorganisms that should be helping you are becoming self-serving and begin attacking the body in order to survive. But wait, there's more. Sodium ions are also drawn to the negative charge of albumin. And we know what sodium attracts, more water. Have you ever seen a picture like this? This is a flooded crop. This is exactly what is happening inside your body when fluids fill up the areas between your cells. Now these crops cannot be used, all right? They're rotting in the soil, too much water. Your cells cannot be used while they are in the same state, but your cells don't have to be discarded and tossed out. I'm gonna show you how to reverse this process here and you can start before you even leave your chair. So at this point, you're in trouble. 
You can't see it, but it's happening inside you. Albumin has left the bloodstream and is now causing the cells to become flooded. The simple sugar glucose is fermenting in this oxygen-poor environment. Friendly microorganisms have been forced to become scavengers in order to survive. And you might want to look up what types of chronic or terminal illnesses feed off of fermented glucose. The New York garbage strike of the late 1970s. People were bringing in the groceries, but nobody was taking out the garbage. Food stacked up in piles and began to rot. Scavengers were attracted to this mess and began feeding, which in turn created more scavengers. And hygiene levels dropped to a new low. Does this sound familiar? That's exactly what's going on here, except now it's going on inside your body, and you don't want that. Another name for what's happening here is inflammation, and all disease begins with inflammation. On the physical level, there are disturbances in the biofield which can lead to physical distress. That's another subject for another audio. But on the physical level, we begin with inflammation. Now you would think that this is as bad as it could get, but like a great suspense movie, things just keep getting worse for the characters we've come to know and love. That's you. And the pressure just keeps building on before the hero shows up to save the day. Now, inside the cells, we have a condition where they're flooded and we're going to have a loss of energy. But how do we end up with this loss of energy? What triggers the stoppage of the power plants inside the cells? Well, it's not so much that energy is being drained, but it's just shut off. Let's look at a quote inside of the October 1962 Scientific American. I have this issue. The article is called Electricity in Plants. The first quote from the first paragraph says, The processes of life have been found to generate electrical fields in every organism examined. From the second paragraph, quote, The delicately balanced distribution of inorganic salts or minerals in and around a living cell, whether plant or animal, accounts for its electrical properties. So here is this article in Scientific American 40, over 46 years ago stating that what we are electrical beings. Hmm. But how do we generate this electricity? Well, the answer is again to be found at the cell level. And inside the cell, we're going to focus on just two minerals. Now these two elements are potassium and sodium. This is how it works. Inside your cells, you will ideally have a low amount of sodium, but a high amount of potassium. Outside the cells, you will ideally have a high amount of sodium, but a low amount of potassium. Well, nature hates a vacuum, or in this case, an imbalance. So the high amount of potassium inside the cell is always trying to get out. And the high amount of sodium outside the cell is always trying to get in to achieve this balance. Now, these two elements are constantly crossing the cell membrane, and it creates an electric charge. It's called the sodium-potassium pump and the 2003 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded in part for research into how the channels that allows these elements to pass through the sodium and potassium, how they operate. So we have these two minerals that are always struggling to find that balance, and wouldn't you know it, when they cross the cell membrane, it creates an electrical charge. This is the charge that powers each individual cell of the body inside you right now. The sodium-potassium pump is believed by many to give your eyes the power to see, the heart the power to beat, and the muscles in your legs the power to walk. It also gives us the ability to transfer a small amount of energy to other people as well. Now, this incredibly small sodium-potassium pump, this generator inside every cell, gets its fuel from a combination of elements. Two of them are oxygen and glucose. Do you remember this? But what has happened here? Well, because of the fluid buildup around the cells, oxygen can't get to the cells. And glucose is fermenting away in this oxygen-deprived environment. Do you think the power plants in your cells can run without these two critical elements, oxygen and glucose? The two elements needed to power your body are not available for use, and your cells will begin to literally shut down, just as if someone flipped a light switch. We're going to learn more in the next part.